Welcome, friends and comrades, to another interview segment hosted by the Midwestern Marx Institute for Marxist Theory and Political Analysis. Tonight, we have the pleasure of speaking with Professor Roland Bohr about Marxism, the Young Hegelians, and religion. Dr. Bohr is a professor at Renmin University of China and the author of many books on Marxism, religion, Chinese socialism, and socialist construction. Some of these include the famous five book series, The Criticism of Earth, uh, of Heaven and Earth, excuse me. And as of the last few years, Socialism with Chinese Characteristics, A Guide for Foreigners from 2021, uh, Frederick Engels and the Foundations of Socialist Governance from 2021 as well, and Socialism and Power on the History and Theory of Socialist Governance from this year, 2023. So uh, without further ado, we'll get started right after this. <laughs> Thanks for being with us today, Professor Bohr. Um, and we always like to begin with a somewhat bi uh, biographical question. Um, so can you can can you tell us a bit about how you came to Marxism and how did the field of theology and religion come to occupy such a central space for you? Well, yes, it's, um, it's always a good question, that one. Um, I grew up in, a, as we used to say, I was a son of the Mans. The Mans was the... Uh, the old Scottish word used for the residence of a minister in the Presbyterian church. Okay, so uh, my parents are immigrants from the Netherlands and they belong to <clears throat> the Reformed Church of the Netherlands, or one branch of the Reformed Church, which is Calvinist. And um, when uh, they met in Australia and um, they were married in Australia while my father was studying theology, and he ended up being a minister in the Reformed Church and then the Presbyterian Church. So I was uh, very much Calvinist or Reformed uh, church background, theological background. Um, it was actually when I, uh, the first real encounter with uh, Marxism in some substance was actually through political and liberation theologies. I was studying a second degree Bachelor of Divinity at the University of Sydney. And there was a course taught there by a um, former missionary to India for many missionary in inverted commas, of course, I mean, that's a very colonialist term. But, um, and uh, we went through uh, developments in, in political theology in a sort of Western context, Western European context, actually, and then also focused on liberation theology. And uh, it was after that course, or during that course, well, I thought I'm going to read what other people say about Marxism or Marxist analysis. I want to actually study the works of Marx and Engels themselves and the Marxist tradition. Uh, that goes back some years now. I think that course was um, in the, uh, oh, when was it? First half of the 1980s, believe it or not, so 40 years ago. Um, so, you know, for quite some time, and I still do continue the interest with the research has moved as sort of indicates with the focus on um, socialist construction of the philosophy of socialist construction in the last few years. I've had an interest in the relationship between the two for four decades now. Um, so, yeah, um, uh, you know, I mean, I sometimes also, um, no, no, by no means uh, comparable, but um, I've always been rather fond of Engels 
uh, especially because he's often seen as someone who plays second fiddle to Marx um, and um, Engels, different contexts, but in his own um, home environment, at least, or his forming environments, very similar background. His mother was actually Dutch background and in Wuppertal, um, quite close to the Dutch border, was very strong, uh, reformed or Calvinist uh, part of Germany. And he rebelled against it, uh, but it was something that comes through, especially in his earlier writings, uh, comes through quite clearly. So, you know, in, in, in a, a curious way, um, you know, my path seemed to follow something analogous to the path that Engels took. Um, so that's the, the background to the, the interest, the personal background. That's very interesting, um, especially considering how, you know, part of the differentiation between uh, the tradition of the Third International Marxism-Leninism and um, whatever could be considered non-Western Marxism is the, the question of angles and how angles is read. Um, it's not just a, a, a split that's based in politics. It has repercussions in philosophy and in some central questions. So. Um, I always just kind of assumed that your affinity to Engels was was rooted in the fact that in our tradition, he's not seen as the corrupter of Marx or some BS, or um, he's also uh, not taken to be the one that, you know, kind of arbitrarily expanded dialectics onto nature or something. Uh, but it's it's I, I definitely see the overlaps there. And um, I'm sure Eddie does as well, because he comes from a, a somewhat similar background. And we've had many informed discussions over that. Absolutely. And Angles has always been my favorite, too. That's interesting. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. 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 Now, there's some amazing stuff, uh, Angles, that is often not um, studied that much. Um, and that really is quite eye opening when you sort of, uh, you know, work it through, read it through, study it differently. Mm. Yeah. It's a shame because, in many ways, that uh, even that idea of the second fiddle, it, it comes from him. He's the one that described himself as, as the second uh, fiddle in this text on Ludwig Feuerbach. And if he was wrong about anything, I think he was wrong about that. You know, I don't think he plays second oh, fiddle. He, yeah, he, he always did see him. He always did place himself in that light uh, in relationship to Marx. And, you know, and fair enough. Um, the problem is I think people have taken that, well, used it actually, not understood quite what's mean, used it to say, well, even Engel thought he wasn't up to the task. <laughs> um, and so, you know, you get this, um, uh, recently, you know, uh, three studies on, uh, Western Marxism and, uh, ideological structuring of Western Marxism and Chinese perception. And it is this curious, curious path among Western Marxists where they, it's, it's not found in, in other parts of the world. Um, that Engels is cut off from Marx, and the reason for doing so, you end up with a very truncated Marxism, uh, where Marx becomes an isolated genius, and um, Engels is cut off from, from Marx, and uh, one of the many reasons for doing so is that he can simply cut off the whole development of the Marxist Leninist tradition, uh, which of course then leads you, if you want to do that as, as you know, a Western Marxist, then that means you, you can ignore all of the subsequent developments, uh, Soviet Union, um, Eastern Europe, uh, through to China, GPRK, Laos, Vietnam, etc., etc., and all the liberation movements in Africa. That's all conveniently just discarded in the process. Very strange thing. And then you've got this weird thing of the return to Engels. It shouldn't have happened. You know, the return to Engels after leaving Engels or cutting him off. But it is a, a strange or curious deviation if you like that took place in um, among western marxists it is indeed uh, uh thankfully there there are some tendencies that are changing today uh but um, we'd like to to have perhaps a, a whole segment with you at some point on angles and socialist construction so uh, we'll move yeah. towards our, our next uh question um so uh, we'd like to talk a little bit about the young marx but uh, before we get there can you tell us uh, something about the milieu which precedes his and Engels' work in the 1840s. The mid-1830s are a turbulent time. 
there's a struggle being waged between the young uh, or the left Hegelians and the old uh, or conservative Hegelians. Um, and it's a struggle that kind of starts with Feuerbach's dissertation, but it really comes out uh, into the open with the publication of Strauss's uh, Das Leben Hesu in uh, 1835. Um, but more specifically, you have this general struggle between the young Hegelians and the dominant order. Um, you write in one of your books that uh, The Life of Jesus, uh, Strauss's uh, 35 books, was uh, less of a, a book and more of a bomb that set the hairs running. Uh, can you tell us a bit about the influence of this text in Frederick Wilhelm III's Prussia? Um, how did it influence subsequent uh, young Hegelian works? And can you elaborate on why the critique of politics in this context needed to take the form of a critique of political theology? Mm. I mean, I'll, I'll preface this by, um, by saying it, it's been some time since I worked on this material. So when I was thinking about um, our discussion today, I need to go back over some of the uh, material and sort of bring it back to the forefront of my mind. So if there's one or two missing points, so uh, we can pick them up. Uh, I mean, we have to we have to consider um, the wider context you mentioned, uh, the context in Prussia at the time, and also the relationship with uh, France and uh, a little bit further with, with England. Uh, widespread consciousness in the middle of the 19th century that the German states, uh, Prussia uh, especially, was uh, lagging economically there it actually really didn't kick off uh, until the time of Bismarck. Um, it was also a time of Marx and Engels, but they were, they were gone by that stage. In the 1930s, there was sort of a strong sense of the economic, political and social uh, backwardness, if you want to use that term, of the situation. And there was uh, almost an effort to wind back the clock or sort of hold back history by Friedrich Wilhelm III and then the fourth. And, uh, you know, there was a uh, severe censorship went on, kinds of discussion that took, could, could happen. Um, they wanted to, uh, you know, stop the French influence coming over. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a claim at that time that the, uh, the Kaiser was... Uh, God's, the head of the church and, you know, God's representative on earth, not quite the same level, for example, as a pope. But, and, of course, um, you find some early pieces, uh, I think, by Engels, where, or, oh, no, Marx is actually, when he's uh, writing for the Rannische Zeitung, um, he's pointing out, well, that's all very well, but, you know, which church? There's a Roman Catholic church, there's a Lutheran church, all that sort of stuff. So it was very difficult to engage in direct uh, political analysis and discussion. And because it was framed so much in terms of theology, the way in which political discussion took place or the language in which political discussion took place was through theological language. And um, this brings us, of course, to uh, Strauss's Das Leben Jesu. Uh, he lost his position and, you know, had to sort of, I think, head to Switzerland in the end. Um, the core, I mean, it's a massive work. It's a massive work. Um, and it's focusing on, of course, the key figure of Jesus. And um, first of all, you know, develop sort of a, uh, an argument for the constitutive role of mythology in developing the story uh, or the account or the reconstruction. But also influenced by an argument that what was so threatening about Strauss's argument was to move away from the singularity, the singularity of the figure of Jesus, and to move it to a plurality, if you like, within uh, each human being. Now, you can see the political implications of this, because if you move away from the singularity of a particular leader, in this case, the Kaiser, uh, Emperor Friedrich Wilhelm third and fourth, especially the fourth uh, later um, with all his claims about leading the church and all that sort of stuff um, you can see the political implications of it because it moves to a, using theological language to, uh, in a western context, a, a kind of 
um, you know, democratic form in which each person then uh, has a say, embodies, um, and so on and so forth. So that's the way I was influenced in, in understanding the, the impact of Strauss's book uh, and also, yes, the, the whole framework of using, uh, sort of arguing that the material of God is actually mythological, uh, not historical. That's a really good point. And I think it's a, a chap in Massey who calls it uh, a turn towards a democratic Christ, right? That's, um, that's, the, that's the word, yeah. Um, good. Let's, uh, we can get going to the second one. Um, so uh, Feuerbach will rise to prominence in the early to mid 1840s as one of the more central figures of the left or the young Hegelians. Uh, can you tell us a bit about Feuerbach's critique of religion? Um, how does it develop on the tradition of, of Strauss and, and, and Bauer, who was originally you know, one of the key figures of the old Hegelians in charge of criticizing Strauss's book, but eventually himself becomes a, a young left Hegelian? Um, and in, in terms of philosophy in general, uh, in what ways is the materialism that Feuerbach elaborates in the provisional thesis uh, for the reformation of philosophy still limited in some ways? How is it not yet a, a form of dialectical materialism? Yeah, I, I, I've been when, in our early communication thinking about that one. Uh, and um, it's interesting what how you see these things in hindsight. You know, as, as is well known, I mean, Feuerbach's argument is that um, the process is inverted, you know, uh, Human beings believe that there is a God somewhere in heaven um, with whom human beings relate and, you know, aspire to join at some point after death. Um, but he says it's the wrong way around because, you know, God is actually, a, if you like, a projection of the, the best of uh, human ideals, values, etc., etc. But when you, when you look at the material again, or when I was looking at the material again, it seems to me that Feuerbach is still actually operating in what I can call an incarnational framework. Um, so the argument I just mentioned that he's, he's saying, well, we've got it the wrong way around, you know, it, it comes up from human uh, existence and is made into a God that human beings then worship and see the other way around, inverted form. But when you look at the material, it is actually still quite incarnational and the language is still within that theological framework where he's, if you start to pick up things where it's 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 a process of, yes, incarnating God in human beings. Um, now he would want to move beyond that, but because he's struggling against that, obviously he wants to move beyond that. But because he's struggling within that framework, within the theological framework, he can't avoid that kind of um, what can you say, argumentative form. Maybe I can put it this way, um, you know, if you're um, engaging in, say, an argument uh, with another position and you allow all of the questions to be set by your opponent and you try to engage in the um, theoretical struggle on your opponent's ground, you're going, you've already lost the argument. Um, and in a sense, that's still what Strauss is doing. This is where it's not Strauss, sorry, Feuerbach. This is where it is ultimately limited um, by the particular la language framework, theoretical framework, and the direction of his criticism and polemic. Uh, and uh, that's my way, roundabout way of answering your question was it's not yet dialectical materialism uh, because it's still caught within that whole. Uh, framework, the theological framework of the time and the developments. Indeed. Um, very insightful. Thank you. Uh, so Marx has uh, various critiques. His critique of the young Hegelians uh, occurs in various periods. It seems that he first has a break in 1842 with a group called the Free, which was composed of Max Strenna, who, uh, his real name was Caspar Schmidt uh, and Edgar Bauer, the younger brother 
of uh, Bruno. Um, and then a couple of years after, he breaks with Bruno Bauer himself, Arno Ruga, and others. And then finally, the last person he breaks with a year after that is, is Feuerbach. Can you tell us a bit about Marx and Engels' overcoming or sublating of the young Hegelians? Um, how did the critique of the young Hegelians play a role in the development of the new dialectical materialist outlook? Yeah, I think when when I was looking at this material, I sort of went through the I mean, it was a bit of a temporal sequence in the writing. Um, I actually started with Bruno Bauer and Marx, um, and they were quite close for a bit. Uh, there's a record in Marx's uh, university certificates that he at least is listed as having ordered and never set any exams in uh, Bauer's uh, course on the Book of Isaiah, the Old Testament Book of Isaiah. Um, and they were supposed to work, work together on a number, set up a journal, um, and supposed to co-publish a number of works. It never actually turned out that way, but there's quite a bit of um, earlier critique of Bauer and the break um, comes through quite sharply, which is part of that. The, the the one that interests me a lot with this, if I can move on to that, in the same group, uh, yeah, as you mentioned, Max Stirner. Um, what's interesting about really uh, the first collaborative effort, um, or close to it anyway, um, the notes and manuscripts that we now know as German ideology, the most extensive section is actually engaged, engaging with Max Stirner. Max Stirner, and it's both a, a, a critique and a polemic, but at the same time, you start to find the first moves to what would later become a comprehensive method of analysis. Um, and it's very, very interesting work. And they do that through their polemic with Max Stirner, who they point out for all of Max Stirner's sort of, you know, proto-anarchist protestations and, uh, critiques of everything in it and um, around um, is still ultimately uh, beholden to a, a theological uh, framework. Um, and Feuerbach is probably the most, there's a break obviously with Feuerbach, but um, also the one that I, has gained most attention from analysis, of course, because you know, the thesis on Feuerbach, which were um, discovered in the notes and then sort of usually appended or at the preface to the, uh, the publication of the edit, edit, edition of the notes became the German ideology. Um, that is both a break uh, because, you know, they needed to move beyond it, but also uh, there's quite a significant amount of, of absorption, if you want to put it that way, in order to make that step beyond. Um, and without thinking through all of these questions and debates and struggles in the, within the young Hegelians, uh, we wouldn't have had the development of the, the method that, you know, over the next few decades that Marx and Engels developed the mode of analysis that they developed. Um, so it's absolutely a crucial period, but it's something they couldn't stay within. One of the most notable features of that is even though you can find, and you know, as I've done in earlier research, there's plenty of material that deals with uh, or references biblical texts, theological motifs, um, the fetishism uh, of commodities or fetishism as such that you find in capital um, has dimensions of this, but it's completely reshaped and transformed in the process. Engels continuing interest in religion. But by and large, after that period, Marx and Engels don't engage in suspended, extended philosophical critiques of theology. Once they've moved past that phase, that direct engagement falls into the background uh, because the method has started to develop, but it had to pass through that initial stage in order to get to where they could in the 1840s. And by the late 1840s, you can see that they're really moving along uh, quite you know, substantially towards that, uh, developing that method.
Yeah, I, I, you you brought up the eleven theses. Well, it, it seems that um, in your commentary on the German ideology, that um, less than Feuerbach, which has been the person that the Marxist tradition has more so focused on, um, the traditional reading is Hegel, Feuerbach, uh, Marxism. Uh, but less than Feuerbach, it's perhaps a little bit more the critique of Strauss uh, that that plays maybe a more central role um, in in that collection of articles. There's some people who I've heard argue that it was a collection of art articles for a journal that we know as a book. And then I've seen other evidence to the contrary as well. So I'm torn as to what to uh, believe with regards to that document, which is so central. Um, but um, would you would you say then that uh, in, in, in some ways, like the culminating critique, um, the, the last uh, straw, if you will, is is, is, is stra uh, uh, Sterner instead of instead of Feuerbach? Uh, look, yeah, I mean, the way I sort of, uh, I think both, I mean, ultimately it's Feuerbach is, is the, the, the last of the critiques, it seems to me, but uh, it's probably a better idea not to separate them out. Um, the difference is perhaps that it's, it's the, the engagement with Feuerbach, it's... Uh, The Braden Tales, seeing the point that, it, you know, it's a metaphor that Marx uses on a number of occasions. It's uh, standing Hegel on his feet. Um, and in a sense, that's done through Feuerbach. Uh, Feuerbach is still following that Hegelian line, to use that metaphor, of standing on its head. It's standing it on its feet. And it's that's where it comes through clearly, that, that awareness, if you like, uh, uh, or the next step in developing a dialectical materialist approach um, has to happen through the engagement with Feuerbach. What's happening with Max Stirner is the need to start developing a number of categories about the uh, the role of, and they're talking about different aspects of society, the state, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you start to get the emergence of, of class analysis that's happening there. So that requires a concrete analysis of economic, social, historical conditions that leads to this, this, um, these situations. And then what are the ideological uh, factors that arise from those developments? And you see um, shorter and longer sections in the negation of Sterner where you start to get these kinds of analysis happening. And I, I um, you know, sometimes sort of imagine, we like to imagine Marx and Engels in the very early days of the cycle of young men uh, who sort of met and realised they um, quite different backgrounds and temperaments, but they definitely had something in common, sort of, you know, staying up late into the night, smoking away, working on uh, these rough notes and manuscripts, uh, uh, which we know is the German ideology and um, the excitement in the process. And, uh, you know, so, and it shows through, it shows through in the notes. Just a, a word on the German ideology there. That's, and there's a lot of discussion about it, of course, now with the, um, analysis in the the mega uh, publication mega two uh, mark singles for example um you know there's different arguments and so on so you've got some i won't name any names who want to sort of separate out the material marx wrote from what engels wrote by on the basis of handwriting others sort of want to suggest that it was never intended as a work um that it's just a series of notes um and uh, that the the editing process that took later again the old you know assumption betrayal narrative distorted whatever was going on i mean there's two aspects of that it does seem um and this is the influence of uh, you know my earlier studies in uh, uh, biblical language and biblical criticism it's the textus receptus the received text so some texts come down to us in light of later editing and then take on a life of their own um, and this is also the case of dialectics of nature. Uh, these were, you know, notes Engels made, some extensive pieces over a decade or more, which he arranged in a number of different folders and then rearranged and so on. And uh, sometimes when I, um, when I encounter works trying to say, what was, you know, what was the, uh, the intention with, uh, you know, what we know as German ideology, 
uh, which text um, you know goes here, which text goes there, and and what was sort of edited and changed. Same with dialects of nature, you know, which which uh, sort of folder or plan plan you know is the um, the original one that Engels had, in which I'm followed, and and I'm, it uncannily reminds me of biblical textual criticism in the way in which they do this sort of stuff. But anyway, so no, the category of text was for kept as a received text. It is something that comes through uh, in developments, takes on a life of its own, and you need an awareness of the history of getting to that point. But it's also perfectly valid to, um, you know, to speak of the German ideology as a, as a crucial text in the earlier stages of the development of thought of Marx and Engels, and later a work like Dialectics of Nature as well. Beautifully said. Yeah, great answer. Um, move on to the next question that I'm excited to ask because um, I grew up in an evangelical family. My my grandfather was a pastor at an evangelical church, and a lot of the values though that were instilled in me uh, by the church and you know through that religion were some of the same values that uh, inspired me to become a communist later in life. Um, and there's been a lot of writing done on Marx and Engels' critiques of religion, and most oftentimes they're very one-sided. Um, so can you tell us how Marx and Engels approach the question of religion and God in your view? Yes, yes, good question, good question, good question. Yeah. Um, I'll begin with the well-known ones, uh, you know, in uh, where Marx is sort of talking about or writing in the uh, introduction to his critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, where, you know, he talks about, uh, uses a lot of different metaphors, but, you know, religion is the, you know, paraphrasing your kind of literally, you know, the uh, sigh of the oppressed creature, the uh, protest, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, he, he suggested it's sort of, in the end, a false solution to it, but already there in the phrasing of those those uh, terms, there's um, an awareness or a presentation of a much more dialectical understanding of religion, if we can put it that way, instead of just a one-sided, uh, you know, materialism equals atheism uh, position, which also was very much part of the the uh, Cold War uh, ideology, you know, atheism, communism, all that sort of rubbish. Um, the substantial work on that, of course, comes through with Engels. And it goes right back to when he was uh, still a teenager, uh, or even younger, actually. And they would attend church at least once every Sunday. And um, Engels sort of picks up in his writings about that. There was a very uh, large churches, many different ministers uh, working in them. Engels picks up... Uh, an element in that, already at that stage, says the criticisms of, you know, uh, the social framework, but actually the implied criticisms of the political framework could actually get the minister in trouble if he took it further, but he didn't. That's just the first glimmer of it, but the obvious uh, moment when uh, or time when this comes to the fore is because of that background, Engels never lost his interest in it, is, of course, the Pheasant War in Germany, published in 1850. And it, it's got its problems. Um, the problem, particularly, that the idea that uh, Thomas Münzer and the, the, the peasant groups and artisans also that he was working with the miners, maybe in, um, sorry, 1525, 24, 25, uh, used an inner language that wasn't theolo theological, but this is the first, if we want to use the term that wasn't used then yet, Marxist analysis of an earlier revolutionary movement in Europe, uh, time of the Reformation, very turbulent time. And it's got a really astute analysis of Luther as well in there, because Luther initially, uh, in the earlier writings, is moving into a more radical direction. It's almost as though, you know, because of the forces that, at work and uh, the Elector of Saxony was protecting Luther, backs off from all of those, especially when encountering Munzer. Um, but it's that analysis that is the first one that indicates that uh, there is, if you and put it quite strongly, there's a revolutionary 
uh, dimension of the history of, of Christianity in Europe, and that it inspired one revolutionary, pre-modern revolutionary movement after another. And what was the main reason for this? There was actually an peculiarly Western notion, transcendence and imminence of philosophical ones. So ontological transcendence, that there is an ideal, perfect world which we cannot experience and is empirically unverifiable, but we, to which we have reference. And obviously in a Western framework, uh, that refers to God, heaven, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. How does this work for revolutionary leaders like Münzer and quite a number of others? It is that the rulers of the present age are not adhering to the divine law, the divine stipulations, the divine values. And what are those? They are actually, you know, to use another phrase, taking the people as the centre, people-centred approach, the well-being of common people. And Münzer's sermon to the princes brings us out and so on and so forth. And so it was actually a high notion of transcendence within the theological tradition, which in was the, the ideological justification, theological justification for the revolutionary movements themselves. The concrete conditions, of course, were oppressive economic uh, realities uh, at the time, but the way in which it's expressed and justified and seen was in this high notion of transcendence. So then it continues on after that, but my answer is already long enough. So yes, it, it's very much, uh, it's, um, you know, Sorry, just one more aspect of this course. It is very ambiguous uh, politically, and too often, uh, you know, Christianity has uh, had a very comfortable seat uh, next to the for a seat next to the powers that be. So it could move one way or another, and the adoption of Christianity as the ideology of empire with Constantine is a good example of that. It's a great answer. Thank you. Um, and feel free to make your answers as long as you want. Um, I know I speak for Carlos as well, so I appreciate it. Um, can you tell us a bit about how Lenin approaches the question of religion and how has it been approached throughout the communist world? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting one. So, uh, I mean, there was a... Lenin was instinctually um, quite opposed to the influence of religion. Well, I should say uh, the influence of the Russian Orthodox Church on political and social life in Russia. I should put it that way. And you can see this in his writings. Um, you know, there's a, a number of pieces which uh, I read, studied some years ago for my uh, study on Lenin. At the same time, and this is where now what is becoming you know, on the concretely on the ground uh, revolutionary movements, then the proletarian revolution, October revolution, uh, socialism in power, sitting out on the socialist road. So this is actually, you know, Marxism in practice, what it's supposed to be doing. Um, and the analysis that they're, they're um, starting to develop and realise, and part of the reason, of course, was that you know, with uh, uh, transitions taking place in, in Russia and in the early days of the Soviet Union, people were coming in, joining the party from inevitably had religious backgrounds, whether it's in the countryside, they've moved into uh, cities where are taking up industrial jobs or whatever. And some of the autobiographies of people doing so is an immense struggle to deal with the, the you know, uh, religious background that they came through. But the realisation with the Bolsheviks was that religion is a secondary issue. Um, it's the core issue, the prime issue is economic exploitation when you're working towards proletarian revolution and then class struggle. And if you focus on religion and attack religion and you're going to split the working class and the peasantry. You're going to split them. And so religion then becomes a secondary issue in that sense that it should not be an issue that splits the solidarity of the working class, urban and rural poor, uh, if one use it, put, put it that way. Uh, and that became an official policy of the Bolsheviks. Uh, but it's, it's a methodological insight uh, that 
something like religion we use other examples. It's necessary to um, critique and attack uh, the reactionary dimensions of religion. But at the same time, uh, it's not to be made a primary policy. And so in the end, the Bolsheviks came up with um, the position on religion that religion is a personal matter. Put it that way. So a person could join the party it was not required for them to make a declaration for atheism on the basis of agreeing with the party platform. And if they were able to do so uh, and agree with the party platform, they could join. If they still had religious inclinations, that was up to them. But they were not to go and proselytize in the party on that basis. So you get the, the clauses of, for example, the um, the platform then the constitution the freedom of religious expression but also freedom of non-religion uh, so that's the other thing that comes into play so that's the the way in which i moved beyond just sort of lenin's work like he did quite struggle with this one because he had you know the influence of the uh, the orthodox church on so many parts of society and life and whatever but it, it's a, a Something arises out of concrete political practice, but also theoretically is very important inside. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's so important, especially uh, in, in the U.S., because part of the anti-communist rhetoric has been telling a, a population of, of largely Christians that, you know, that Marxism is <laughs> um, anti-God, anti-religion, and they're going to force you to be atheist or something. Um, so uh, as for our next question, uh, religion, as Marx and Engels had already seen, is largely politically ambiguous. On the one hand, it could be used to make people dormant in the face of oppression, to eternalize and neutralize class exploitation and enslavement. On the other, it has been used in directly opposite ways too, from the Peasants' War in Germany, which we were just talking about, to the Black Freedom Movement in the U.S., to the 19th century utopian socialists, and the tradition of liberation theology in Latin America. Although some of these questions that I'm about to ask you have answers which vary because of the differences in context, um, at the level of political praxis, how do you think a communist movement in a non-socialist country should approach the question of religion? Should there be concerted efforts to collaborate with progressive churches, uh, to make a religious commission and say a party or something. Um, what do you think? Yeah, well, good question. Good question, good question. Um, hmm. I'm thinking of a number of angles of trying to answer this one. Uh, let me, there's two parts to this one. Okay, I think we, we need to consider clearly the, uh, let me use the term culture here, cultural tradition, the culture in a much wider sense, so history, society, political assumptions, and so on and so forth. Um, some countries obviously have a long cultural uh, tradition of the influence of religion, even if in, uh, I don't know about the US, but I know in other Western countries, by and large, most people don't believe in God and not interested in attending church. And yet, of course, the very frameworks come out of, of millennia, if you like, or at least hundreds of years, millennia, of uh, theological frameworks in Western countries have shaped the ways in which uh, assumptions about society, politics and uh, culture work. Uh, and in those contexts, and this also includes, you know, um, Eastern Europe, Russia, et cetera, et cetera, where um, Eastern Orthodoxy has been deeply influential. In those contexts, it's a very interesting one. Do you, apart from, you know, all the different, let's take a, you know, well, a left-wing party, a communist party, is there actually a religious commissioner and so on? Uh, uh, alongside all of the other ones, I mean, Oh, I, I think it would have to be up to the parties to, to uh, decide on that one. I think uh, one thing that is noticeable, though, is it tends when a party, a, a communist or workers' party, has a history in a particular country, they're also shaped and influenced by the ways of thinking that come out of that background. 
Um, and so the, the, the atheistic communism uh, aspect of it is sometimes appropriated uh, to have a profound suspicion of religion. That said, that said, um, I do know that uh, in the various peace movements, um, it has sometimes been Communist Party that has taken the initial steps uh, for developing peace movement. Good examples are 1980s, which then, as it gained in popularity, had some of the major churches come in to play a role and became the Palm Sunday peace marches uh, in, the, uh, in the 80s. So they do actually collaborate on, if you want to call these uh, things, from the United Front work, but that's more of an ad hoc basis as for something that's more permanent in that. Um, usually what you find in this context is that it's a bit like one of the, um, the early, uh, one of the congresses, the Congress of the Bolsheviks, religion question to be dealt with later. That was it. Um, and that's where about it's left. Um, I think two other parts of this. So I'm talking about different cultural traditions in Latin America, um, as you well know, with its long and complicated history and the influence of Roman Catholicism in those parts and the arisal of, of liberation theology that uh, took place. Um, it's been crucially important, whether we're talking about the, the Cuban revolution, the Nicaraguan revolution and so on, the role of uh, religion, particularly that kind of enculturated Roman Catholicism in those areas, has been absolutely crucial. Uh, and, you know, there is a recognition of the importance of this in light of the context. Um, I'm now getting finally to the second part of my answer. When you're actually looking at a situation if socialism in power, which is a shorthand, obviously, for our proletarian revolution. Uh, and a Communist Party or a Workers' Party uh, in power and actually begin that complicated dialectic process of construction of socialism. Uh, it's pretty standard that you, you get freedom of religious expression and freedom of non-religious expression. Uh, that, that's standard. Uh, um, you know, I, I now live in China, I live in Beijing, and I'm very interested in this uh, aspect of it, that the uh, the CPC, Communist Party of China's policy on, on religion, they do actually have uh, a special sort of section that deals with religions. And there's a long history here of Buddhism, which has really become part of Chinese culture and civilization, but also Islam has been in China for hundreds and hundreds of years and Christianity on and off but continuously for 500 years. Um, they, all of the religious groups are represented in the uh, Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference. Uh, there are regular meetings with the uh, religion department and the leaders of the different religions. And the emphasis is uh, on developing autonomously, not subject to external, you know, control and developing or becoming participants in the path of socialism and Chinese characteristics. In a sense, that's easier afterwards. So, and I say this because in a sense of, for about two and a half thousand years, if you want to put it this way, use the term, Chinese culture was already secularized two and a half thousand years ago. There's no need for ontological transcendence. There's no need for a personalized God within a Chinese cultural thing. It's not that lack, they just don't need it. And even Christians in China think of God as a sort of depersonalized entity. It's not personalized because of the influence of that tradition. So you've got a very different cultural context, and yet you have maybe it makes it easier for them. Maybe it makes it easier here to do that. You actually have a significant um, awareness of the importance of religion within a particular project. I'll put it that way and leave it at that. Yeah, that was a great answer. Thank you. Um, I noticed that in some of your work, you refu refuted the idea that religion is the main cause of wars and conflicts throughout history. So could you briefly explain why this 
idealist view of imperialism is not correct. Mm. Again, Which it's, is it's, it's, just, oh, just to prevent something real quick. Uh, this is prevalent even in parts of the U.S. left, which is uh, surprising. You see uh, the host of one of the major channels of the social democratic left, uh, the Young Turks. Um, Eddie, I'm forgetting the name. Do you Frank remember Huber. the Frank Huber. Yeah. He recently described the uh, the Israeli apartheid regime um, and, and the conflict at play as a, a conflict of religion or something. So he... You made precisely the mistake that I think now you're you're about to debunk, but yeah, go ahead, sir. Yeah, yes, I know it's it's a common one. Yes, yes, and um, you know, for example, uh, uh, it wasn't until until fairly recently in some parts as well. It was, uh, I guess, the great uh, what a Christian Muslim clash and the demonization of Muslim majority countries and killing of. of you know, tens of millions and destroying lives of hundreds of millions of others, um, almost, you know, trying to revive this sort of medieval fear of uh, in Europe of, of Islam. Um, yeah, look, I mean, it goes back to the, the insight that developed the Bolsheviks that in that in that respect, religion is a secondary phenomenon, um, according to Marxist Lenin's approach, and that being a secondary phenomenon, it's not a prime cause. Okay, in their case, it was, you know, the attacking, making religion a core feature of their attack that split the working class and the peasantry. Uh, and in this case, we can uh, say quite clearly that it's not the primary cause. I mean, yes, you're going back to this sort of idealist uh, dimension of it. I mean, if you're going to use a comprehensive method, going to use a comprehensive method of analysis, then obviously you're going to look at the economic, social, class situations that lead to these conflicts. But again, the context influences these things so much. Uh, and then, you know, the, the, the religious framework is part of the, the ideological framework within which those things work. Um, but, yeah, you know, it's, it's uh, not much to say on that. The, you know, religion is the main conflict, a, a cause of conflict. One of the, the problems with that was, of course, it's promoted by the, what I call the new old atheists. I mean, it was supposed to be the new atheism, uh, 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 wanting to make uh, various different arguments. I kind of had a bit of a look at it quite some years ago. But one of the arguments was that religion has been the main cause of conflicts throughout human history. So if you abolish religion, put me into, you know, all of those conflicts. I mean, it's, it's just purely delusional. But, yeah. Very interesting. And, and um, I wanted to bring it back real quick because uh, you you started uh, talking about the, uh, the, the relation of religion to the CPC right now. And um, oh, yeah. you began touching on the relationship of how uh, Sinified Marxism, Chinese Marxism is, is thinking about uh, its its own tradition of Marxism and its own older uh, civilizational traditions, uh, deeply rooted in Confucianism and other forms of uh, philosophy, religions. Um, and it reminded me to uh, of a passage that you bring up in uh, Socialism with Chinese Characteristics, which I we hope to have you back on to speak about that question in itself. But um, it's, uh, you say in, in 1925, the communist writer, uh, Guo Morao, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, he, he published a short story entitled Marx Enters a Confucian Temple. It tells of a conversation between Marx and Confucius in which Marx is asked to explain his idea of a communist society. Marx does so, after which Confucius is unable to contain himself, clapping his hands and crying out. Uh, your ideal society and my world of Datong coincide with each other. Thereupon, he quotes the text from Liji and replies, uh, in reply, Marx calls Confucian, Confucius an old comrade and observes, your opinion is completely consistent with mine. I thought that was a nice little datum. Of, I remember after reading that, I had to post the, the quote on Facebook. It was a very nice but. Um, would would you like to elaborate on that? How has that um, how has that relationship developed in the last uh, yeah. you know, 
basically. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I probably should. It's, it's a short story. I probably should translate it and just put it up because um, I don't think it's translated. I, I love it. It's great for a short story. Um, and the time is very interesting. It's quite early in the piece. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, on the weekend, it was up at uh, it's a place he, he called Fragrant Hills. And uh, it was the last home for about a year of the CPC Central Committee um, as they were sort of moving uh, before the liberation of Beijing. And um, there's a photograph after the uh, focus very much on the liberation of Beijing and then the liberation of the rest of China. Um, but Gormor was in one of the photographs there. He's one of the uh, um, writers who uh, was obviously keen to see those sorts of developments. Um, look, let me, um, I mentioned earlier that there's, it, it, unfortunately, again, it's using Western terms, but there was a kind of a process of secularization that went on two and a half, three thousand years ago, uh, put it that way. So it's very important to understand that it took quite some time. So this is the Zhou dynasty, which is from about 3,000 years ago, which took over from the previous Shang dynasty. And Shang dynasty still had a lot of sacrificial rites uh, and worshipped uh, a number of, of heavenly beings, one of the main one being Shang Yi, which means literally the Lord on high. Um, and when the Zhou dynasty uh, really did usurp the Shang, and they had to find an ideological justification for that. And that's where you had the concept of the first early developments, the mandate of heaven. But then heaven here is a very abstract, disembodied term, tian, which just means sky. Um, but the other thing you started to get, and one of the early ones is actually while there was the, the new um, king or monarch or Zhou emperor was very small. There was a duke of Zhou for a long time in um, overseeing the affairs of state, setting up structures. And what he did very clearly early on was say, okay, well, that's the Ministry of, of Religion. We'll put that over there. Because actually the main concern that we have is focusing on governing and the people. And you start to get this development over time where, yes, well, it's there, but... And Confucius also says, just to paraphrase, but ask the question, what do you think about the gods and spirits? And he said, well, I, I find it's good to respect the gods and spirits, but really uh, my attention is elsewhere. My attention is on society, on, on cultivating, you know, and developing, um, you know, improving the situation and so on uh, for common people, um, improving one's life and improving life society. So you get this very early process taking place. Okay, what's the relationship with Marxism to that tradition? Um, there's been some some recent materials, and this it does go a long way back, but uh, shorthand is it's called two integrations, the anchor G here. What are the two integrations? It's the integration of basic principles of Marxism with China's concrete conditions. That one's been quite clear since the late 1930s. And that's what socialism Chinese characteristic means. The second integration is with the best of China's traditional culture. Now that has actually also been kind of spontaneously happening. Gormor was one example, an example of this. But it was actually only identified as a clear uh, position in um, celebration of the centenary of the CQC in July 2021, elaborated further at the uh, General Secretary's speech at the 20th National Congress in October last year, and then the most significant statement at a forum in Shandong province of Confucius' birthplace on uh, cultural inheritance and development. And then you've got methodological principles relating to how you relate to the best of China's traditional culture. So, yes, it's a really, really hot topic here in China. And I've written a couple of essays, and on basis of that, was asked to write a short book in a crazily short space of time. That was July and August. Um, it's shorthand for that. Um, on the one hand, there's a set of values that come out of the tradition which are regarded as highly compatible with scientific socialism. Okay, so that's the values that are there. And a lot of discussion about which values and so on take place. The more important one uh, is what are five methodological principles for engaging with this uh, process. And it, 
for example, they include that there must be, even though they come from different backgrounds, there must be uh, they must be a good fit for one another. It's not just a matter of putting the two together. There must be a profound chemical reaction that uh, transforms uh, in the process. That's very much a dialectical process. Um, it's a way for Marxism to gain a much longer and wider road, but also, that's for Marxism, but also the recognition that Marxism is the leading principle in this relationship. And it has been, if some people say, had an enlightenment influence in China, but it also then moves on to say, gives a particular identity, if you like, uh, and cultural confidence in the process. So it's absolutely fascinating how all of this stuff is happening. I just want to give one example. Okay, how does this work? All right, Da Tong, Great Harmony, is one of the most famous um, texts in the Book of Rights by Confucius. There's also the moderately well-off and healthy society, Xiao Kang Society, which became a policy position of Deng Xiaoping. That also comes out of the tradition. There's many, many others, but the question is, how do you engage with traditional culture? And, and Western tendency is to see modernization opposed to traditional culture. We've got to preserve it, but otherwise modernization kind of wipes it out, if you like, or you know, leaves a lot of it just sticking in some museums and stuff like that. Um, so there's the Chinese translation of Alf Hebu is uh, Yang Qi. And it's become the philosophical translation. Now, our Pei Bong, as you know, is the negation and then the transformation uh, and raising to a higher level of what is negated. Now, Yang Qi is a philosophical translation of it. Uh, you can see that this is stuff that I've been working on recently. Anyway, but it actually is an agricultural metaphor. So the Yang means to throw up into the air, as when you're throwing up grain, uh, winnowing grain. And so you throw it up into the air with a, a large shovel or a large, um, you know, rake or something else for the purpose. And the wind takes away the chaff and the, the heavier grain kernels fall to the ground. You do it again and again and again. So you end up with a pile of kernels. The chi means to discard. So what that means is to take or draw out the essence and discard the dross, the dregs. And it is a, a distinct understanding of how the dialectical process works, which I see as kind of almost an extension of our people. And an example that I like very much uh, in this is many examples. You can say, okay, we can take some values and draw them out. You know, um, literally uh, the whole world is common or all under heaven is common, a common good. Um, the people are the foundation of the state, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, they're fine. One that I like very much is, can you actually transform a value that is so embedded with the feudal system when it was first developed? Uh, because, you know, you get this, oh, well, there's some democratic ele elements in this, and socialist elements in it, but the feudal dregs and dross needs to be discarded. Hierarchical social relations, you know, monarch, uh, lord and peasant, and all that sort of stuff. There is one that's called appointing people on the basis of merit. That's virtue and capacity. Now, clearly, that's embedded within a feudal system, Chinese style feudalism. It's not the same as the European style feudalism. Um, and the initial reason for promoting that approach is very much Confucian emphasis was to overcome the hierarchical principle. That if if you know the the son of a landlord would be assumed to move into a position of influence in the imperial bureaucracy, and the way to overcome that was to emphasise capacity, ability, merit. Can you transform that, which is embedded within a feudal system and structure? Well, in order to answer that question, I think you have to go back to Marx's notes on the Cunin statehood and anarchy, where he asked the question of elections. He said, to understand the nature of elections, you have to look at the economic base. And if you have, have um, you know, antagonistic relations in the economic base, exploitative structures, you're going to have class conflict. And when you have class conflict in political parties, elections will have a political character that is an antagonistic character. Um, but if you are in a different system, he leaves it this way, in a different system, 
where you don't have an exploitative economic base, you don't have antagonistic class relations, and so on, what do elections do? They have nothing of today's political character. In other words, they're depoliticized elections. What does that mean? People are elected on the basis of competence and experience. Now, it seems to me that's logical. That's how elections should work. Long answer, but I think you can see how I'm getting to the point that even something like appointing people on the basis of merit that comes out of a feudal structure can then be alphabetical, negated, transformed, taken up to another level, or yang qi, uh, you know, um, draw out the essence of Scarlet Dross and becomes a principle for uh, appointing people um, and electing people to positions of responsibility. Uh, in the current system. So, yeah, very long answer to your question. There's many parts to it, but um, it is a, a absolutely fascinating discussion that's taking place uh, here at the moment. That's so interesting. Um, and I really appreciate, I think that the Chinese term is yang shi uh, that you use. Yang qi, yes. The, the yeah. metaphor that he uses to describe Al Alphibang is is so beautiful and so on point. Um, uh, but yeah, we actually had, uh, both Eddie and I were lucky when we were undergraduate students, one of our uh, political science uh, professors, uh, he did his, uh, dis he had done his dissertation work on China. He had traveled to China for some years and his work was in exploring that area of how um, the Communist Party is, is developing a new sort of relationship with Confucianism and this tradition and how they're, uh, you know, looking for ways in which to sustain rational kernels or reflect on how certain rational kernels were already sustained and, and what was uh, um, uh, what was casted out. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I find that uh, fascinating, uh, fascinating discussion. I, I, wish I, I wish I I spoke the language so that I had more things accessible to look at, but um we we have been going for a little bit over an hour now um it's been an incredibly insightful uh discussion you have so many different areas of of your work that uh, that i follow and and that I, I i recommend and um and and sometimes i look at what you publish and i'm like how does this man publish so much so quick it's just uh, book after book after book after book and great articles so um it truly is an honor to to to, to be talking with you and um, we hope to have you back on to speak about uh, socialism and power, um, to speak about China, um, and, and hopefully to, uh, to also speak about some of your recent work on, on Western Marxism, which is uh, excellent, and it's participating in a tradition of, of critique of Western Marxism that uh, we find central as Marxists in the U.S. Uh, to participate in. Um, but... Uh, any closing remarks, anything you would uh, like to plug to our audience before we go? Uh, look, I just want to say thank you very much for the opportunity to um, to discuss some of these things. And actually, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to discuss the Marxism religion question. And sometimes since I've done it, you know, initially we are sort of setting up this discussion, I thought, oh, okay. Um, but it's actually been very interesting to sort of think about these things, which I do from time to time, but also in a bit of hindsight after being in, in, immersed in it for so long. So thank you, especially for the opportunity for doing that, uh, having that kind of discussion, very insightful. It's also very encouraging the work that, that uh, you're doing over there as well. It's great to see. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you. That means a lot. Carlos, you're muted. Uh, all right. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Bower. And uh, without further ado, uh, we'll get going the same way we came in with the Glorious International. <laughs>
racial injustice and economic injustice cannot be solved without a radical redistribution of political and economic power.